What's going on guys, this is Rob, and we are covering uh, Dark Crisis, Infinite Frontier. Technically speaking, Infinite Frontier is not officially part of Dark Crisis, but think of this as like the Jonathan Hickman Avengers into Avengers run for Secret Wars, right? Like, technically, this is not part of Dark Crisis, but it is, right? It just, it leads up to it, right? So it all just tells one cohesive story. Now, here's the thing, right? There's gonna be uh, some explanations and stuff going on in this, right? You know, it's been a little while since we covered DC, but uh, the, the cool thing about this is, you don't really have to have read anything between the end of, or I guess the ending of the whole Perpetua, you know, Dark Multiverse, all that kind of stuff, and this, which is really the benefit, because I wasn't gonna go back and read all that stuff if I didn't have to. This basically opens up with what is in effect Batman, and it looks like Flashpoint Point Batman crash landing somewhere, right? And of course, we end up finding out this is Earth 23. Now, for those of you guys who aren't familiar with this, Earth 23 is cool. And a lot of this really goes back to Grant Morrison's multiversity. So, for a lot of you guys who aren't familiar with that, Grant Morrison's multiversity was at the time kind of a wonky story. In retrospect, and given the kind of things that DC's done specifically with the multiverse, it's become one of the most important stories that have been written in the last. I don't know, what would you say? Like 15 years of DC Comics? Uh, that, that predated the events of Final Crisis back in 2009. So it's a pretty significant event, pretty significant story. What Multiversity did is it well, was really told in a weird way, but it kind of reintroduced the idea of the multiverse, which was heavily used by DC Comics when the multiverse was brought back during the events of the New 52, or at least kind of modified during the events of the New 52. And then going into like the post, you know, Dr. Manhattan landscape, which DC never did anything with, um, that it kind of continues on. So the, the multiversity model of the multiverse is still kind of the definitive standard that's used by DC Comics. But the thing about this is that Earth-23 is the home of Calvin, also known as President Superman. And this guy's cool. Now, for those of you guys who know about that, you're probably hyped because things are gonna, you know, like right off the bat when we're dealing with like basically the House of Heroes and the, the Multiversal Justice League things are gonna get kind of wild, and they do. So here's the thing, <laughs> here's the thing. And, and, and what this does is it really just kind of picks up with this idea of the Justice League facing off against some threat that's out there. And of course, this threat's not considered like a great big huge deal. Things are kind of defeated, the day saved, done and done. But on this reality, Earth-23, the Justice League as we know it, has largely shifted. It consists of the same kind of core members insofar as like their powers or the namesakes they follow. So like a Green Lantern, a Superman, that kind of a thing. But what it doesn't include are the characters that we're the most familiar with as being core members of the Justice League. So of course, you have a Green Lantern, but it's Alan Scott. You've got Mr. Terrific. You have Hawk Girl, which is always cool to see. Uh, you've got these characters, right? Vandal Savage is part of the Justice League on this, on this alternate reality. It's cool. Now, characters like Alan Scott, most people are familiar with. And the funny thing about this is Alan Scott basically ends up bailing out and uh, taking off saying he has to go meet with his son, of course, meeting with, uh, with Obsidian. And then when he does, there's a few things that are kind of left ambiguous here from DC Comics. For those of you guys who were not familiar with Alan Scott, he was the first Green Lantern DC ever published in terms of like comic book publication history. He was the OG Green Lantern. Initially, it was just a mystical ring that he got his powers from. It's really all it was. And he had a weakness to the, to like wood, like physical wood. It was weird. Comics back then were kind of strange. As time progressed, especially following the introduction of future Green Lanterns beyond uh, Hal Jordan, like Jon Stewart and Guy Gardner and Kyle Rayner, eventually Alan Scott was brought into the fold of the other Green Lanterns and made an official member of the of the Green Lantern Corps, given like an official Green Lantern ring. And so as a result of that, of course, him meeting with Obsidian, there's a few things we don't know. So Obsidian and Jade, for those of you guys who don't know, are the children of Alan Scott. They were really more members of Infinity Inc. than they were JSA. And the relationship between those two groups is that the Justice Society of America, if we go with the more recent iteration, so we, we move away from like the old stuff, from before Crisis on Infinite Earths and we get rid of like that multiversal concept. The idea that JSA really from the 1990s going forward, specifically during Jeff John's run, uh, really in the 2000s, is that what you had is the JSA operating as what were basically heroes during World War II. And then once World War II came to an end and a lot of those heroes retired, it left the landscape open for the new heroes that we're used to. So Bruce Wayne, Wonder Woman, Superman, Kal-El, those guys. Infinity Inc. was kind of the missing link between the two in the sense that Infinity Inc was really the offspring or the younger protégés of the Justice Society of America continuing that legacy on. And so that's why, despite the fact that Obsidian doesn't really have powers identical to Alan Scott, although Jade really had powers more similar to her father uh, than Obsidian did, that they continued on as kind of the, kind of carrying on the legacy
courtesy of Alan Scott and Infinity Inc. So again, it's a kind of a cool concept, but really it's just one of these things where they're just kind of having a conversation, talking about stuff. When it comes to Obsidian, one of the things that happened later on is he actually ended up retiring from superhero antics. Um, that doesn't look to have happened at this point in time. The other thing that goes on here, and this is really more just kind of filling in the gaps for people uh, who hadn't really been reading anything or people who were kind of new to DC because Infinite Frontier was billed as a pretty significant buildup to the events of Dark Crisis. It's really just kind of running over what we already know, right? In the sense that what you had at least was the whole Perpetua versus the Batman who laughs, who had taken the power of Dr. Manhattan and that great big huge battle that happened between the two of them, the multiverse basically being eradicated and then being recreated, uh, presumably through Wonder Woman by means of those individuals who had created all of existence, who were just kind of these nebulous, ambiguous beings that exist out there. Uh, but the thing about it is there's a lot that we don't necessarily know in, in terms of Obsidian himself. And it's not the most important thing. What is important here is that there was an old JSA headquarters that was based in Gotham City, and that's kind of where they're operating out of. But when Alan Scott and Obsidian get here, the whole place explodes. And the initial thought is that basically Jade is stuck inside because Obsidian can't sense her life force anymore, right? He can't sense her presence. Like, she's just not there. And so that's when he starts to freak out, wondering like, what in the world is going on with his sister? Now, that's an important thing because what it does is it starts hitting on this idea of superheroes vanishing, people basically being taken. But what we end up doing here momentarily is we switch over to kind of an interesting situation, which I was surprised to see this, if I'm being honest with you guys. So what you do is you pick up in Paris where you basically talk about how the JSA headquarters have been blown to pieces, right? Just kind of a, a newspaper or a really like a digital newspaper, right? A news story that was being written about, of course, that was tweeted out, how it had kind of exploded in like green flames, which indicates that like maybe Jade or somebody is involved. But with the explosion being what it is and the fact that the energy based on that explosion seems to emanate superhuman energy, what this does is it leads to this realization that this is Cameron Chase and she's basically being met by Director Bones. Now, for those of you guys who are unfamiliar with them, and I imagine there's a lot of people who are, a lot of folks who are just like, okay, I have no idea who these people are and I don't know why they matter. Make it make sense, Rob. Okay, so here's the thing. In, in DC Comics, do you guys know Amanda Waller? The head of the Suicide Squad, all that kind of stuff. Amanda Waller was a multifaceted person, meaning that she had multiple groups and organizations operating under her. Because it's one thing to just send people in on some crazy suicide mission and hopefully it succeeds. It's another to have the information she needs to pull it off. And that information didn't just come from like government satellites or things like that. The DEO, the Department of Extra Normal Operations, I'm pretty sure is what it was called, uh, was basically the intelligence arm of Amanda Waller, that it was led by Director Bones. So think of them as superheroes policing superheroes or monitoring superheroes, different things like that. And not just superheroes, anybody with superpowers, metahumans in general. Um, and so that's really what's going on here. Cameron Chase was one of the absolute best detectives they had. And of course, Director Bones was highly capable as well. One of the funny things about this guy, he has skin. The difference here is that it's translucent. You can't see it, but if you touch it, it were to kill you. So that's why you see Director Bones wearing gloves, and that's why you never actually see Cameron Chase touch him. And you probably, you'll never see anybody touch him, at least they shouldn't, uh, over the course of this, unless they want to die. So that'll be kind of a focal point if someone's going to get killed off. But this is really more Director Bones just bringing Cameron Chase back in, saying the DEO's been reformed. Now again, something that I want to want to reiterate here, this is all taking place on Earth-23. So we don't know exactly what direction or exactly how the DEO operates. If it functions under Amanda Waller, if it's different things like that, we don't know exactly how this works. We're really just kind of speculating here based on what little information we're given because the reality is we never really saw a deep dive into the universe of Calvin, of President uh, President Superman. We never really saw that. Instead, what we do is we transition to, uh, to, to Batman, to Thomas Wayne waking up, and we get one of the greatest characters to ever grace comics which we knew was coming as soon as we got President Superman. We knew he was on his way, ladies and gentlemen. We knew he was on his way. As this person begins to awake, this group is talking amongst themselves that this, this ship that he crash landed in does not match the material of any known universe in the entire multiverse. So it's kind of strange. Nobody knows where he came from or how he got here. Well, they, he was brought to, to this to the House of Heroes because he crash landed on President Superman's front lawn, but or at least his parents, his parents' farm. But the thing is, the guy starts to wake up and he is met by Captain Carrot. Yes, 
Captain Carrot. I love Captain Carrot. Captain Carrot's a super bunny. And I've, you know, I've seen your comments, right? I've seen your comments of people who are saying things that Rob has this irrational love for Captain Carrot. Why does Rob love Captain Carrot? What's, what's the deal with Rob and Captain Carrot? People have been shipping us in your weird ass fan fictions. It's, we it's, it's strange, man. Not even gonna lie. I read a couple of them. I was curious. Don't judge me. I've read a couple of them. Y'all are weird. You're some weird people. Just throwing it out there. But uh, nonetheless, <laughs> I love, I don't know what it is. I just love Captain Carrot. It's awesome. You may not love Captain Carrot, but hey, at least he's not Black Bolt. Black Bolt sucks. But the thing about this is that uh, this is ultimately, of course, Thomas Wayne waking up, trying to figure out what's going on. And he's met by the arrival of, of President Superman along with the Justice Incarnate. Now, one thing that I always also want to reiterate here, and which I hope is true, is that whenever you see like the words of a team written that way, I'm really hoping that's how he says it, right? You're in the House of Heroes and we are Justice Incarnate. I really hope that's how he says it. Like that's the way it's said, because I feel like it would be amazing. <laughs> But of course, for those of you guys who are unfamiliar with Multiversity, Justice Incarnate, the House of Heroes, things like that, it's basically a, multi a multiversal Justice League. That it is a Justice League team you know, essentially composed of different people from across the multiverse. These are the core members, but they're not the only members. There's all kinds of members there. And a lot of them are reserves in the sense that they operate in their own universes, doing their own thing. But when there's any kind of a massive calamity, they call everybody together, right? So not every superhero across the multiverse is part of Justice Incarnate, but a good chunk of them are. Of course, the mainstays, as you would expect, the core members of the Justice League from virtually every reality are usually members of Justice Incarnate. But of course, Thomas Wayne really just kind and it says, okay, and the reality that I come from, like it's a huge upgrade compared to the Superman who's there. So one of the things that I want to iterate, want to reiterate here, one of the things that I want to throw out here is that what it looks like is this is not just some random version of Thomas Wayne who exists out there. This is Flashpoint Thomas Wayne. Because those of you guys who recall the Flashpoint storyline, the Superman in that universe was captured as soon as he landed on Earth and was taken to an underground bunker by the US government where he was constantly exposed to red sun radiation. So his powers never manifested. And even when they did i mean he had all his strength and speed and all that kind of stuff but he was all emaciated because those muscles never grew but the thing about this is of course you end up having thomas wayne who's like you need to get me in contact with barry allen and when the question when 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 he says this like the question of calvin is like which one now of course we know he's referring to earth zero barry allen and the reason why is those guys who don't know earth zero barry allen that's the one that worked with thomas wayne during the events of flashpoint to basically try to gain his powers back and to try to fix things so the two of them have a strong history together they've got a really really lengthy history together just from the events of flashpoint and how far reaching that story was and in fact at the end of it because of the the kind of escapades and what had gone on thomas wayne had made a request of barry allen to bring a letter to his son in barry allen's own universe right to actually kind of communicate across the multiverse to his own son it was pretty touching it was a very sentimental moment in that story but the thing about this is of course you basically pick up presumably after this kind of conversation has taken place and this idea that barry allen has kind of gone on this mission at the request of Calvin to find what is in effect this dark you know, universe that exists out there. This one that just cannot simply be accessed through conventional means. And the way that, the, or at least the conventional as far as Barry goes, the way we know that is because historically speaking, ever since the events of Flash of Two Worlds, where Barry Allen first met Jay Garrick, the original Flash from DC Comics, Barry has the ability to vibrate through realities, right? To vibrate from one universe to the next. And that's how he usually, usually travels the multiversal space. The only alternative, which usually deals more with time than anything else is the cosmic treadmill but the but that can be used to traverse the multiverse itself if you're talking about going back to a point where you know before a universe came into existence as a result of some decision that was made and then ride the waves of that new universe into its existence and then show up in that alternate reality it takes longer and it's less effective than barry just kind of doing his thing but uh it is it is also more it allows barry to be more precise in terms of where he's going based on that particular context but the reality here is Barry cannot vibrate into this alternate universe. He doesn't quite know why. He simply just knows that he cannot do it the way he normally would. So what he ends up doing here is he basically vibrates through the multiverse and picks up all this multiversal energy and is really just kind of building up his power because for whatever reason, there's a kind of barrier or it requires more energy than he possesses. But ultimately, he ends up vibrating into this alternate reality where he arrives on what's called Earth Omega, right? Seemingly the final Earth is kind of what it, what it seems to be called here. But when he arrives on the scene, 
like immediately he's like, okay, so things are a little strange, right? He's recording this and of course sending it all off to the Hall of Heroes and so on. But he talks about how this world has no vibration. There's no frequency in this universe. And so because this universe has no frequency, this is the reason why Justice Incarnate could not travel here. Because remember, they travel from one universe to the next the same way Barry Allen does, that every universe has its own vibrational frequency. If you can hone into that frequency, you can literally vibrate there, right? You can just kind of disperse your, your molecular structure into that new universe and then just be there, right? But the Hall of Heroes or, the, or Justice Incarnate couldn't do it, Barry couldn't do it because this place has no vibrational frequency. It's an anomaly, right? It's seemingly cut off from everything else. But once he gets here, he also finds out the quintessence has basically been killed. Now, the quintessence, as it was initially presented to us in DC Comics, that was one of those things that had kind of been hit on over the years, but we really saw them as a major player once you got to the whole, like, ending of the Dark Multiverse storyline, right? The conclusion of all that work that had been done with the Batman who laughs and everything. But the quintessence was, in effect, a representative from each of some of the more powerful groups or some of the most powerful members uh, beings who existed in DC Comics. So you had the Phantom Stranger, you had the Spectre, but you also had, uh, you had one of the Guardians of the Universe, right? Just different things like that. Each one of these guys was ridiculously powerful and somebody had seemingly murdered them. Now, one of the things that's kind of crazy here is that Barry says there's no sign of a struggle, but those energy signatures are off the charts. He doesn't know what to make of it, right? He doesn't know how could it be that some of these ridiculously powerful beings, right? The Spectre, Phantom Stranger, especially these guys who are nearly God level in terms of power would basically be killed and there'd be no sign of a struggle. Either they submitted themselves to their own deaths, which seems highly unlikely, or some force out there was able to take them by surprise and destroy them. Now, how this happened or how it is this is this can be done is explained in Dark Crisis. Don't spoil it for yourself. The buildup is much better than if you just go and read it. But the thing about this is Barry's just kind of caught, caught unaware. So he's like, okay, like something's going on, but whatever this is, is huge, right? Like it's a massive thing. The problem is before he has a chance to really send everything off the way that he's supposed to, he starts going through these crazy emotional states where he's like exceedingly happy and giddy. And then he's like really irritated, that kind of a thing. But his emotions are running nuts. And he's like, what in the world is going on here? And that's when this voice comes out of nowhere. And it says, you should have stayed further away, but I am happy you're our first visitor. You and I have been down this path before, haven't we? Witnesses to a great crisis. But even after you triumphantly came back from the dead, you never tried to find me. And I gotta be honest, that really hurts my feelings. Only for us to find out, this is Psycho Pirate, right? Now, for those of you guys who don't recall, who don't know about Psycho Pirate, him and Barry Allen go back, like back, back, like the original Crisis on Infinite Earths back, right? Psycho Pirate was one of the only people who remembered how things were after the events of uh, Crisis on Infinite Earths had come to an end. But Psycho Pirate in Medusa's mask, of course, as we've talked about before, allows him to manipulate the emotional state of people. So it's one of those things where he can be a very, very dangerous person. And in fact, him being here is done seemingly on behalf of some force out there that's disembodied and that we don't see. And it simply says, you can toy with the Flash after you fulfill your promise, but remember your role in this story. And that's basically it, right? Like that's all we really get about this voice. There, there's really nothing more beyond it than that. And so ultimately Psycho Pirate's like, yeah, there's a new crisis coming, Barry Allen, and you're gonna help us find something or rather someone. And so what you end up doing is you transition to this diner in this really, really cool moment, right? You transition to this diner where you have like this guy who's just sitting there and drinking a cup of coffee while you have all these people who are debating what's going on with the multiverse. Because one of the things to know, the average person was not supposed to know the multiverse exists. They were not supposed to be aware of the fact that it's out there. Now, it's it's as far as we're aware, we're not necessarily told that this is anything other than Earth 23. So presumably, we're still on Earth 23. I don't know if that's definitively the case. That seems to be the case, but we're not really given a clear cut answer here. Instead, as this conversation's going on, it's this idea that like the Justice League had basically saved everybody, that reality was essentially fixed. So this seems to indicate it is Earth Zero. It's the main DC universe because it was the Justice League in the Earth Zero universe who did seemingly save everybody. But it's one of those things where people kind of see it in two different ways. Some people see it as mass hysteria, that it's all just made up and it's nonsense. Other people see it as an absolutely true thing. And in fact, this particular girl actually recalls the world ending. Not everybody does. And so it's one of those situations where people, a lot of people who don't really believe the multiverse was destroyed and recreated, look at all these people who are talking about how they recall the multiverse ending and everything kind of blinking out and coming back and how they all share the same experience as something like a Mandela effect, right? Like they all remember it, but it doesn't mean it happened because I don't remember it. If something that big did happen, I would remember it, right? Like that kind of a thing. But in the midst of all this, you kind of 
to have this great big huge fight that breaks out, you know, between like this guy who's pissed off about some things that have popped off and so on and so forth. And now he was impacted by it. And of course, this dude with the red hair basically steps up and says, no, 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 you need to go sit back down. Everybody needs to chill. In the middle of all this, this great big huge explosion happens and you end up having like these, these folks that come in out of nowhere and address the guy with the red hair as Arsenal, Roy Harper, which is awesome, right? Because Roy Harper, let me tell you something, man. This dude has been through it. Like this guy has been through it. It's crazy everything that goes on with Roy Harper, right? Arsenal is a really fascinating character. This guy's a big deal. But what they also say here, and it's really context that's important, it's let's catch us an arsenal, not let's catch arsenal, it's a arsenal, one of many arsenals, right? Like a varying version of arsenal. So literally they seem to be traveling around the multiverse and just capturing Roy Harpers. We don't really know why, we simply just know that they are. And so where this great big huge fight breaks out, Roy Harper is, you know, he really kind of tackles this guy to save his life, you know, knock him down out of the, the direction or out of the path of a energy blast and that kind of a thing that what goes on is Roy Harper's just kind of met with this okay uh this is crazy this giant like black fist just pounds everybody like literally knocks the roof off of this whole place this whole diner and then Roy Harper is out but when he wakes up he ends up waking up in a place that he's unfamiliar with only for us to basically find out that Roy Harper has essentially become a Black Lantern I mean it's crazy right like it's it's crazy right like literally Roy Harper just like knocks the knocks the doors off this place like these shadow folks are making their way towards like this these these you know enemy guys like these bad guys and it's like what in the world is going on but when Roy Harper wakes up he's a Black Lantern right and he has quite and he's quite literally creating black lantern constructs more so than that these constructs he's creating are different iterations of himself so that's the bigger question to ask here like what is going on with this how did roy harper become a black lantern with that being said guys we're gonna bring this to an end <laughs> thank you all for watching and i will catch you all later peace